Our final speaker for this session is Lawrence Williams, who is Vice President of Strategic Relations for SpaceX, managing governmental affairs and developing the company's base of international customers and strategic partners. Mr. Williams received his bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado and master's in business administration from Georgetown University's International Executive MBA program. Prior to joining SpaceX, he served as senior vice president for business development for the satellite communications company ICO Global Communications and as vice president of international and government affairs for Teledesic Corporation. His government experience includes having served as a special assistant to the administrator of the U.S. National Telecommunications and Information Administration, as a member of the presidential transition team for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and as a legislative assistant to U.S. Representative Ray Thornton on the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Mr. Williams will discuss moving beyond Earth, building a 21st century space company. I want to thank the Smithsonian for this uh, opportunity. I've got to say uh, this is, I think, a very exciting time for the industry. Certainly this is a thrill for, for me. I know probably like a lot of you all, uh, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum has been uh, some of your most direct interaction with the space industry, and uh, it's, it's really a thrill to be here. Um, I'm, uh, as uh, the introduction said, I'm not an astronaut. Um, and uh, actually, this is such a cool room. I think I'm going to try and this stage here, see if I can use this. Um, unlike, uh, I'm not an astronaut like Buzz Aldrin, so therefore I'll probably never be on Dancing with the Stars. This might be the, the closest opportunity I ever have to be on a stage like this. Um, am I already going here? Aha. I, okay, hopefully we'll just go forward and we'll be to the next one. Okay, there we go. Excellent. Sorry, thank you. See if I can work all this wireless technology. Um, so actually, my background, as the introduction said, I'm, I'm really an entrepreneur in the space industry, and I've become somewhat of a, an expert, I guess, on working with the government, both as sort of a regulator and as a customer. Um, I don't know how many of you all were here last night at the uh, for the Orphans of the Apollo video um, for the movie. It was uh, I thought it was really interesting for me, and I'm going to sort of, in a way, pick up where they left off there. Um, during that time period when there was the uh, Miracorp being uh, developed. I was working at a satellite communications company called Teledesic. It was also known as the Internet in the Sky. And my background is really more in telecommunications and space is a medium for which you can do a lot of interesting things, whether it's exploration and exploring the moon and the stars, or whether it's to use it, uh, satellites, um, which are effectively tall towers for in providing Internet access, video, telephony. And uh, at that time, one of the things that I noticed working in that industry was that one of the things that was really holding us back is the cost of access to space. And we've heard a lot about that today. Um, and, and I think from listening to some of the presentations, you might get the sense and draw the conclusion that some of the most exciting times for the space industry are behind us. And uh, I really don't think that's the case. I do think we actually are on the edge of a revolution. And I think one of the things that's gonna, gonna help launch that revolution is bringing down the cost of access to space. That was one of the, the, the main things that I think that held Teledesic back and a lot of the other space ventures is the cost of getting access to space, as well as actually operating in space. So it's not just getting to space, but the cost of the hardware um, in which we, we need to operate in space. Um, so I don't think that there's uh, any silver bullet uh, breakthrough or technology or invention that, that, that's gonna launch this new revolution. I think, as, uh, as Dr. Logsdon was saying, it is gonna be a series of innovations and I think that's some of the things that we've been working on at, at uh, SpaceX that I'd like to talk about. Um, and I think that like in the case of uh, the technology, another uh, uh, part of my background is working in wireless telecommunications. You know, when cell phones were first developed, there was a famous study done by McKinsey at the time for AT&T that said there was only gonna be a need for about 200,000 telephones in the United States by the year 2000. And of course, um, AT&T, ultimately bought back into the industry many years later by buying out a company called McCall Cellular for $11.5 billion because they had decided not to invest in the technology. And what I think launched that revolution was the cost of access to the technology and the fact that as cell phone technology came down, all of a sudden you really launched into a revolution. And that was something that you couldn't necessarily determine by just asking people 
would you want a cell phone? Because until it was inexpensive and everyone had one and you had that network effect, then that's what launched the revolution. And I think that that, hope, that will be the case very much. And in many ways, that's where we stand today in the, uh, in the space industry. Um, and one of the things that has been failed from some of the other companies that have, have tried to launch into this before has been things like trying to find this silver breakthrough technology um, or uh, in the case of like a company called Kessler Aerospace, trying to do things different in space by just integrating parts of the aerospace industry that were already existing. And that's definitely a different uh, approach than we've taken at, at SpaceX. So the first slide that I'm gonna put up in a, in a mo moment is gonna talk about what it takes to get to space. So uh, give, that, uh, uh, give that a thought you know, to yourself. What does it take to get to space? And you know, it, a lot of things come to mind, but really what it costs to, to, to get to, to, to the access of space, of course, is a vehicle and the lowest uh, possible cost of that vehicle is gonna be the sum of the material parts that make that up. So what are those? Um, so the goal at SpaceX to develop a family of vehicles that will ultimately reduce the cost and increase the reliability of access to space by a factor of 10. That's the big vision goal of SpaceX. And the cost of getting to space, what is it that you have to do to get there, really are made up of five things. The overhead of the organization, operations, propulsion structures, avionics. And that's really what it requires to get to space. And you can't decrease the factor of getting to space by a factor of 10 by just attacking any one of those five because the biggest thing that people think about when you to getting to space are things like the engines. Well, even if you got you know, some breakthrough, technology breakthrough uh, invention that allowed you to have free engines, this, this still the biggest decrease that might be is makes up about maybe 20% roughly of the cost, it, historically it's been on some launch vehicles more than that, but if you just assume that it's even equal here at 20%, then the best you're ever gonna do is a 20% reduction. So that's not gonna get you a factor of 10 reduction. You really have to attack, attack costs at every different level, and that's what we've tried to do at SpaceX. Um, just on the top one there, overhead, that you know, includes all the personnel and, the man and really the management. Um, for those of you that are engineers, I'm not. There's something that's often used, uh, a term that's used, the signal to noise ratio, and especially in communications. Well, at SpaceX, one of the things that we talk about, signal to noise ratio, where the signal is engineering and the noise is management. Um, so we have as mi minim minimal management as possible. Unfortunately, I often, uh, they put things like government and business development and, and, and things like dealing with the government uh, affairs as, as, as in the management. So sometimes I might be considered in the noise, but hopefully not here today. Um, the keys to success, obviously the people, um, the chart on the left there, I know it's small, but you can see we've had a significant growth. That's a challenge that is often overlooked. It's one that I think taken for granted. How do you hire good people? You gotta hire the right people. We brought on people from other industries. We've tried to learn the experiences of other industries and adapt a lot of those things in the space industry, things that are standard practices in other technology areas, but have not really been utilized in, in the space industry. And part of that is really the active role of the government. So the go I believe the, go the government is very good at doing basic research and technology. They're, they're very good at sometimes uh, pushing innovation and developing things where there's no commercial, um, current commercial investment. But the best thing that happens in terms of innovation and in terms of economic growth is when the government might develop a new area but then step out of the way and let the commercial sector come in. And I think that's where we stand right now with regard to, to developing low Earth orbit and finding the benefits there. Um, talk a little bit about in-house production. Uh, we do a lot, we make a lot of the technology at SpaceX. We, um, it, it, we're innovating on a lot of uh, other um, developments of the past. There, there was a comment made earlier, I think it was um, by Howard from GW that was saying that, are we just leveraging rockets of the 50s or uh, somebody got up and asked that question. And yes, we are, without a doubt at SpaceX, we are leveraging all of those uh, developments. We stand on the shoulder of giants the, the, of the Apollo program at NASA and of the Russians that developed the vehicles. But we are also incorporating the latest technologies into that and a lot of innovations that have happened since then in microprocessors, use of ethernet, even Linux software we use on our vehicles. And we can do things in a way that they were not able to do them and incorporate them into our vehicles. So we have a very advanced, actually it's the first rocket that's been developed in the 21st century, the very advanced rocket but if you look at the fundamentals behind it, the engine uh, is a pencil t style engine, was actually based on the original lunar descent engine technology, pencil technology. And so a lot of it is technology that has been developed by others, but that we're innovating on it. So how do you lower the, the, the price and increase the reliability? Because it, a low cost 
vehicle is not really low cost if it's not reliable. We, we have to make sure we actually can get to space reliably. So we really do focus a lot on the design of the launch vehicle. Um, and we think the design is, is a very important, uh, probably the most important aspect of how you have a safe and reliable vehicle. And we've also, in, in doing that, tried to make it the most simple launch vehicle. So if you look at the way our launch vehicles are designed, I'll go into a little bit of that, but it, we, we've minimized the number of stages. No, uh, there was a, um, at, in one of the presentations earlier talking about single stage to orbit. That's, that would be a nice thing. Nobody's figured it out yet. So, uh, so far, the only way you've been able to get to space is using a minimum of two stages. That's what we use because one of the leaders of, of launch failures is, is stage separation events. The number one leading contribution to launch failure, however, is propulsion. And we've tried to use, as I mentioned, a technology that's been, uh, been around for a long time. It's, we're the first company to incorporate it into booster technology, so our pencil design um, we're the first ones to use it in that way, but again, it's an innovation. We're innovating on something that's been done before, but doing it in a different way, in a much more cost-effective way. And we use that same engine on both the first and the second stage. It seems sort of obvious that by doing that, you would cut down in terms of your cost, because in terms of things like, as I mentioned before, the launch operations is a big, a big uh, contributor to uh, launch costs. By having the same engines, you means on the ground operations are simpler, the same fuel, um, the, the same structures of the, of the vehicle. It's just a, the, the, the second stage is just a shorter version of the first stage. That means the same tooling, the same processes. Called the, we went from Falcon 1, not to Falcon 2, uh, but to Falcon 9. Not because it was the ninth rocket, but because we used nine of the Merlin 1 engines on, from the Falcon 1 on the first stage of the Falcon 9. So nine engines, Falcon 9. And then the Dragon spacecraft goes on top, or the one to the left with the hammerhead fairing, that's for satellites. And so when we started SpaceX, uh, again, something we did differently, we went after the only proven revenue stream in space transportation, at least in the commercial market, which is satellite delivery. Um, and that's actually what led me to the company. And that allows us to build our book of business that we have now, which I'll talk about a little bit more, um, on the back of a proven industry, commercial industry. That has not always been the, the case in the past, example, like Kistler Aerospace. Um, a little bit on the Falcon 9, I don't want to go into a lot of the details, I'll be happy to talk about afterwards, but I um, want to make sure I get through the slides. But if you look at it, very simple design, the production I kind of talked about, we believe uh, very much in testing. So we're, we're uh, I think, the only launch company that actually tests our entire stages on the ground and, and runs our, we, we actually do a full mission duration firing of our first stage. So we're big believers in, in build and test. Um, and then that is also, as I talked about before, the designs led to simpler operations. Then what we've tried to do is build all that learning. Learning is very important, and as was mentioned earlier, failure is a very important part of learning. Um, we've had our failures. We had the first three Falcon 1s that were not successful, but we learned a tremendous amount. We then had a very successful Falcon, a Flight 4 of Falcon 1 and Flight 5 of Falcon 1 when we put our first uh, operational satellite in orbit. And then we rolled all that learning into Falcon 9, and we've had two successful flights. That's, uh, we've we launched twice, both flights successful. So, so far, uh, knock on wood, I am a little bit, uh, not wood, um, there's no wood up here. Um, we have had two successful flights uh, of, the, of the Falcon 9, 9 um, both of them successful, so 100% track record of, su of success so far. And then we've got the five meter fairing, and then we're gonna roll that into what would be the largest uh, launch vehicle flying uh, since the, the, the days of Saturn V. Uh, we currently don't have anything today in the arsenal, unfortunately, uh, as capable as the Saturn V, and that would be uh, the Fal what we call the Falcon Heavy, and uh, hope to launch that. We'll be, have the hardware done uh, late next year. We'll probably end up launching in 2013, and that would actually bring the cost. The Falcon 9 was uh, currently is about uh, $2,500 per pound to orbit. The Falcon Heavy will get us down to what really has sort of been for a long time this magical $1,000 per pound to LEO. Um, so a little bit on the space, SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. Um, that's the vehicle that we've developed in cooperation with NASA. It, 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 now that the space shuttle has retired, uh, a, a magnificent vehicle. Um, but as you can see, and just even from looking at it, very different design. It was optimized to be a truck. Um, uh, like a, a cross-country hauling truck to build the space station. What we've done is tried to design something that's optimized to bring cargo to resupply the space station as well as crew. Um, so therefore, we don't have the huge hauling capability of, of the um, space shuttle. But um, we have the, the largest contract to bring cargo to the space station now that the space shuttle has been retired. 
and we are in the process of evolving that to uh, move to Cruise. So I'm just going to go through a, a little highlights video of what we've done to date. If you could turn. Lift off of the Falcon 9. 